Today I'm with multi-hyphenate uh, artist Tom Dangora. He's an actor, a singer, a writer, a producer, a general manager. You do it all. Sure. Yeah, why not? You're a jack of all trades, a master of none. Well, I, you know, there's a lot that I want to cover with you because you cover so many different uh, disciplines in the arts. Um, but I find that it's best to just start at the beginning. So, like, what got you interested in the arts? When did you come to New York? I came to New York in uh, 2000. <clears throat> I had done a couple of uh, years of summer stock and regional theater, uh, mostly in New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire, or New England. I'm from Massachusetts. Um, and I came here to do a children's theater tour in November of 2000. It was Nutcracker the Musical. I was Godfather Drosselmeyer. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I never left. Well, that's um, so when you you. you... You were out there as an actor initially, right? I was, yeah, I was. <laughs> were you, so did you not think that you were? Uh, did you not? No, think... I thought I was great. I just think other people didn't think I was great. <laughs> did you find? Did you have? So maybe you can walk us through a little bit of like that struggle. Like as an actor, you're in New York. Yeah. The competition is fierce. Everybody was the best yeah. in their high school. Everybody was the best in their, you know. Yeah. No. Um. You know, it's really competitive. I wasn't a great singer, but I was a very good performer. I was a very well-received comedian, you know, mm -hmm. I did very well in, with comedy and, you know, um, but I, I hated acting. I hated playing a role. Um, I was really good at playing myself. I didn't even really like singing. I just did it because you could be big and larger than life. Um, so I ended up being a singing waiter at Ellen Stardust Diner. Oh, I didn't know that. That's I the did. first I'm hearing about <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I, I was there for a year. It's a horrible place to work. But um, yeah, they've been in trouble over there. Oh, they're years. yeah. No, I mean, there's everything you hear there. I experienced firsthand. Um, the you know the best thing I that ever happened in proof of karma was those poor waiters that won that settlement. Right. You know. But anyway, that's a whole other story. But everything you hear is true. They fired me for requesting Christmas off. For asking to have for they asking. Said, they said just get out. Yes. If and I said asked. and I said well I'll I'll work it. I just wanted to see if you know since I've been here a year. If, if I could, and they said nope, you shouldn't have asked, and that is one hundred percent the truth. Wow, it's such what a, what a, it was. Their, it's oh. such a great platform. The idea of it. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It is. And it did. You know, it really, uh, it really helped me. Um, you know, kind of learn how to sing for my supper, learn how to uh, learn shtick, yeah. and so um, while I was there, I would tell these stories. You know, I'm a, I'm basically a professional fan. I really, I, uh, I like. I like divas a lot. I like fabulous women a lot. Um, and I really just like things that I like. I'm a big fan of things. And I would tell these ridiculous stories that I didn't really think were quite ridiculous, but you know, how I would stage or stock these, you know, um, maybe not the biggest Broadway stars, but they were stars to me. And the stories were, would just get these huge laughs. And um, people said, you know, this is funny. You should do like an act just about you stalking random people who aren't even that famous. And boy, did you. I you did. did. I did. And it was called Divas I've Done. And I wrote it and starred in it. And Michael, my husband, Michael, directed it. Uh, it was 18 years ago, I think. Yeah, 18 years ago. Oh my God. And um, it was only, so we were only going to do it two nights at Don't Tell Mama for fun. It was honestly for fun. And that's what was awesome about it. It was so much fun. It was so stupid. It was just so stupid. Silly comedy. It was just so dumb. And we just, um, we, we loved how stupid it was. And we just reveled in how stupid it was. And I had three brilliant backup singers. The girls could sing me under the table. The girls could sing anyone in New York under the table. And that was also awesome about it. We said, it, you know, we got to think like Madonna. I'm the star. So I don't have to hide anywhere because I was the star. But um, yeah, no, that's what Madonna. I saw no, that in her but, thing. Yeah. yeah but uh, so just because Madonna wasn't the best singer in the world didn't mean she wasn't going to be surrounded by the best in the world. So you'll see a lot of people that don't have the best voices who then will have singers with them who, you know, will also not be good singers. To make themselves look better. That's, that's not good that's for the, the show. Wrong. 
That's like no. Seinfeld talked about that. Like, so you, you surround you surround yourself with the best. It lifts you up. And we we weren't hiding. We weren't saying, you know, I was Boy Streisand. You know, on a on a good day, I could maybe live up to an eighth in lane. On a good day, you know. Mm -hmm. So we had these girls. So we did two nights. Uh, the great Sydney Meyer, who was you know been the booking manager, of don't tell Mama for a thousand years. He the first night the show went so well. He. Uh, tipped off a few of the cabaret reviewers about it. So uh, I did the second show not knowing I was being reviewed. And then all of a sudden there were these rave reviews and both shows were sold out. You know, I sell tickets. Yep. yep. And so uh, we added three more shows next month and those were packed. And I backstage came and gave me a rave review and I kept getting rave reviews. So then we ended up doing it every Sunday for the rest of the year. Um, again, packed and more great reviews. Then I won the Backstage Bistro Award, which was I, all I wanted. That was my main goal, so I was so excited. Then someone brought it to L.A. Someone actually paid me to go to L.A. and do the show. Um, and again, we got rave reviews in West Hollywood. Then I brought it off Broadway to stu upstairs at Studio 54, and we actually closed that room. I was the last show to the ever last play show that. In there. Mm -hmm. And we moved to Theater Row, the Kirk Theater, which I would end up knowing very well years later with Musical. And so it was this wild um, two and a half year run. You said something earlier about like um, that the show was so dumb and so stupid. So but stupid. And I, I think that as actors, a lot of times, and maybe some people watching, you know, we take acting so seriously yeah. and we get and we really make it uh, about ourselves and all the different techniques. But I think that it's important to remember that that acting for plays or uh, television or films is really. It's really entertainment. Yeah. And well, the word is play. You play. Yeah. It's a play. It's called a play because you play. There's um, a lot of different sty there's styles. Now out the there. trick is, you do take the ridiculousness seriously. Like you, you, you know my show, a musical about Star Wars, right? Which is the stupidest thing that ever happened, but it's actually it's very well planned stupidity. You know, it's very it's very curated, very calculated dumbness. Right. And you lean into it and you own it and it, you have to be 100% committed to it. And you don't take yourself seriously at all, but you take the show very seriously and you live in the rules of the show. Right. You know, but it's, it's yeah, like, let's, let's just have fun with it. My whole show, even though that, you know, technology had already moved on, there were video and whatnot. We did it. Everything was made out of cardboard. Everything was glitter and everything was cardboard cutouts glue all handmade by michael who as you know is a genius with that stuff um and you know a lot of people uh made the comparison to peewee's playhouse <clears throat> which to me was the coolest thing you could ever say to me right and then it was all said and done and they said so you know well what's next you know you had this big hit and they said well i think we did such a good job producing it i'm just really sick of having to be have have the discipline of being a performer I'm sick of having to do everything and then step on stage. I think I want to try doing everything and then pouring myself a big old cocktail and watching the show. And so we immediately did. I closed Eva's I've Done on Labor Day of 20, uh, 2005. We had become very good friends with the women the show was about. So uh, this was years ago, almost 20 years ago. So I was really obsessed with Marla Schaffel, who was Jane Eyre in Jane Eyre the Musical in, in 2001. Marla Schaffel won every award in New York you could win except the Tony. She was so robbed. She was nominated and favored to win. And then they completely cheated her out of it and it ruined me. So she was one of the people uh, in Divas I've Done. I mused about what her career would have been if she won the Tony, which was the name of the song I sang about her, which was a parody of If I Were a Rich Man from Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> I, um, hear, I can hear it in my yeah. head just feeling and, it. Uh, and, uh, I also, uh, part of the show was about Maya Days, who uh, was in Aida. She was Mimi and Rent on Broadway in the West End in the first and second national tour. She did the Broadway revival of Superstar. She was really, really like the Broadway it girl uh, at the turn of the century. And she had this huge single that was number one in eight countries called Feel It, the Chimney Song. And I was obsessed with her. Um, you know, now we're best friends. She got ordained and was the minister at my wedding. And but um, I was just, you know, I, I saw her 32 times in Aida in the front row. And oh. I would throw her two dozen roses every time I saw her um, on a waiter's salary. 
So, um, you know, she was in the, uh, the show and then uh, I was always, my whole life, obsessed with Ellen Green from Little Shop of Horrors. Right, yeah. And um, I had produced her album while I was doing Divas I've Done. And we went to London with her and with her one woman show all over the country. And um, I was also really good friends with Christine Petty. So these were who I, they were my back pocket girls, uh, you know, um, 15 years ago or so. So we were thinking, what do we do with them? These are our back pocket girls, you know? Like, what, what do we do with these, these divas that are so different? And that's where we came up with the idea. Michael said, why don't we do a Christmas show? They don't, you know, they can, it can be all different types in a Christmas show. And that's where our Broadway diva Christmas was born out of. And um, <clears throat> crazy now that I know everything I do, but <clears throat> back then when we were so young, this was mid-October, and we thought, okay, well, so we'd have to start performances on Thanksgiving, which means we'd have to start rehearsals in two weeks and raise all the money. And do, Okay, we could probably do that. Two weeks yeah. is fine. We did it. We did it. And the show was up, and we played eight shows a week from Thanksgiving to New Year's. And it was um, Ellen Green, Maya Days, Marla Schaffel, Kathy Breyer, and Christine Petty. And it was um, the show was fabulous, fabulous show. Um, still probably the best show we've ever done. It was magical and sophisticated and sleek and we got rave reviews and the audiences loved it it just couldn't make a profit and that's where we started learning the lesson about budgeting there was no way to do something so high quality spend the money that needed to be spent for it to be what it was because the idea was you get like a mini carnegie hall but in an intimate setting we were at the julia miles theater which is no longer there on west 55th street because we had to have 20 plus ceilings so their voices could bounce. And um, the show was amazing. We lost a fortune on it. And there was just, you know, there was there's no way on paper for a show like that to exist. I always say it's the kind of show that only like two kids with wide eyes and good taste. But that's could really something, produce, right? It's like know? there's an audacity to, uh, especially performers in their youth, that, like, at least for me personally, I'm always trying to get back to that. Like, I always missed that part of me that just mm -hmm. didn't know and was audacious enough to go out and do something. And I feel like my best work. And I, So there's something, I mean, like, the, the show was amazing. Oh, and, you know, and I, I will never forget thinking I was such, I, I was so shrewd negotiating the theater contract. Now, true, I was being very shrewd because um, we were booking this theater to start in two weeks. And they had had a show drop out. So they needed to book it. I needed a theater. But I just sat there like I was Cameron McIntosh, you know, do, and uh, I brought a red Sharpie to the meeting. So, and I opened it up and thought I was so cool. I think I was 25 years old, 24 years old, whatever I was. Trash removal. I don't need the trash gone. They can stay on the sidewalk. I'm not paying for that. And they were like, what? Well, it's standard. Well, I don't care what it is. I'm not paying for it. And I wouldn't give them 5% of the box office. Which is crazy. I mean, what's they, the point? They were only asking for five percent. But that's the but yeah. everyone does it. That's yeah. the point. Yeah. That's the whole point of right. I wouldn't give it to them. I was like, give me five, then give me a percentage of the concession. Oh, then that yeah. So no, I, I was, yeah. and, I, and that is logical, but that's not how it's done. And and it was so ridiculous. And I negotiated such an unbelievable deal for this theater, but you have to be ignorant to do that because I would be too. I would be so embarrassed. Uh, to if you ever hadn't do had that, that again. experience, then no, now, you know, but... yeah. If I did it now with you know twenty years in the business, I couldn't, I couldn't do it with a straight face because it's so ridiculous. And I had uh, the best sound designer in New York, uh, Carl Casella, did my sound design. He's passed away since, but he was a genius. You know, he was a Broadway sound designer. I believe he was the first sound designer in history uh, to be signed by William Morris. He was a genius, but that's what I. He was the best, and I had to have him. And I mean, the sound, it it sounded like Carnegie Hall. It was yeah. unbelievable. Um, yeah, but that show was magical. Magical. It was so good, we booked, we did the tree lighting at Rockefeller Center. Wow. We got booked, like Megan Mullally and Al Rucker introduced us. We did the tree lighting. I can't get one of my shows now on the tree lighting, you know? But, uh, it was a magical show. But it's not, yeah, it sounds like this is sort of the um, the dilemma of a lot of producers, right? And a lot Or a lot of creators, because I think it goes beyond just you know, professional producers, but a lot of creators have this issue. It's like, I want to make the best thing I can make and not lose a fortune. Mm -hmm. And that's really tough to do. Yeah, like, it's really hard. I mean, that's the that's sort of the problem that's the that Broadway has with, you know, looking at reduced capacity. It's not, exactly. not it's not an option. It's not an option. Um, 
Before we go on to that, because I do want to talk about your opinions on those things, mm, but sure. I want to know about naked boys singing. <laughs> what about it? Well, I mean, were you um, were you in um, involved? You were an actor in the show. I was. Uh, 20 years ago this June, um, I had just finished a children's theater tour, and um, I was so excited to just finally be in New York. I'm from Cape Cod, and I had been doing regional, summer stock, Every time I got to New York, which I guess is, was a blessing, every time I got to New York, I'd get a job that within a day to take me out of New York. Which That's very that's, nice. That's, that's very good. That's great. But, I, I, um, you know, after 10 seconds in New York, I knew this is where I needed to be at all times, you know? This is home base. This yes. Is, yeah. Yes. Um, before I moved here, when I was doing, you know, stock and whatnot, I thought, I just want to be a regional actor forever. I don't, I just want to do shows everywhere. Then I spent nine seconds in New York and said, nope, I don't want to leave. So I get back from this children's theater tour. I had just been gone for three months um, all over the country. So happy to be back. And it's April Fool's Day. No, it's not. No, that's a different story. Hold on. <laughs> I'm not even high or anything. But I was high at this moment. I had smoked pot with my friends, and they were on their way to McDonald's in Times Square because four of us shared this 400 square foot apartment and the phone rings and I had just smoked so much pot, which I am in favor of legalization. So I'm in no way, I'm happy to say I enjoyed a lot of pot when I was young. Um, and the phone rang and I, and I said, hello, and I, hello, this is Larry Baker. I'm the stage manager of uh, naked boy singing and we're doing it in Provincetown and we had someone drop out and we'd like you to come in tomorrow. And I said, Fuck you, Evan. Am I allowed to swear on your little camera? Yeah, yeah, it's you. I said, fuck you, Evan. I thought it was my roommate, Evan. I was like, I know what you're doing. You're pranking me because we always did pranks. You did things like April that. April Fool's, yeah. huge. That's why I say April Fool's. We would do these big jokes on each other, you know. And I thought, and I said, oh, please, I'm going to get fucking naked. Okay, dude. And and he's like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about, but we were just told you're really funny and you're good looking. And, um, blah, blah, you know. And I said, well, no, I'm not like that kind of good looking. That's why, are you serious? Is this real? And he was like, yeah, you got referred to us. You know, we're, 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 do, we're, we have to cast it. We start rehearsal Monday. Can you come in tomorrow? It's an immediate replacement. And I said, oh, I mean, okay. Well, um, I had to audition in the musical director's apartment because it was so last minute. So I didn't know what to do. I thought like I had to be like, you know, not the Nathan Lane type of a gay boy that I had to be like that hot kind of a gay boy. So I like practiced like unbuttoning my shirt being like, hi, I am Tom, I am a sexy gay man, you know? And so I knock on the door and I'm like, just, you gotta be cool and like sexy. You gotta be one of those gay boys. A, like a star. Like, idea. yeah, you can't, like you can't be Midnight the gay cowboy. Tom. <laughs> the door opens. Well, Stephen Bates was a very well-known and brilliant musician, musical director, and he were, has worked with everybody. And so had his uh, boyfriend, Larry Baker. So they had a wall of fame. The door opens and I see a signed photograph of Liza Minnelli, B. Arthur a wheat thin box signed by Sandy Duncan. No. And I threw my bag to the ground and went, oh my God, you know Liza? And I, and I was like, oh my, I have to, I'm stealing the wheat thin box. How do I need this? You know, and then, <laughs> and they were like, well, yeah, we're very good friends with Sandy. Our dogs, Buddy and Betsy actually used to be hers. And I'm like, those are Sandy Duncan's dogs. Did they have glass eyes? Like I was just so ridiculous. And they started whispering and I was like, oh no, I just was, too much myself to get the job. Oh, I blew it. Yeah, you were too, right. So what they were whispering was, he whispered, if this kid can even speak on pitch, we're signing him now. And so, and I, I even cracked. I like, I cracked in the audition. He, and he literally went, whatever, I'm the musical director, I just won't give you those notes, you know? It was just, it, so I signed a contract on the spot. Uh, I was the first of the day to audition. They just told everyone to not show up. They just said, forget it. You know, and that is a really, and I, when I teach master classes and whatnot, I think it's a really cool lesson because that job changed my life. Um, it changed my whole life. It's where I met, started meeting my first big contacts. The show was a massive hit. It was in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which was very funny because I'm from Cape Cod and I finally moved to New York and I got paid a lot of money to go home. Um, but, um, it changed my whole life. Obviously I started directing and producing naked boys years later and have made a lot of money off of it. Um, Provincetown played a giant part in my career in life. 
and I made a fortune there and, you know, made some incredible friends and whatnot. But it was really a life-changing job in every aspect of the word. And what's so interesting about that is you look at so many conservatories, um, so many classes, so many teachers, and they are constantly trying to knock the individuality out of actors. Oh, my God. They that's are so, trying yes. to say, they're trying to make you a cookie cutter. And they're saying, well, if you don't act exactly like this successful person, then if you're not going to get 99 jobs out of 100 jobs. And you know what? I'm here to tell you that's true. If you are not identical to the legion of cookie cutter, boring, perfect types with that just do everything perfectly but have very little character or personality of their own, you will miss out out of 99 out of 100 jobs. However, the one job you get will be can be life changing. And that's the thing. And there's, you know, when I learned that that day, even if 100 people came in, there was only one me. And they wanted that. They wanted the ridiculous. They wanted someone that was going to flail and be larger than life and flip out over Liza Minnelli. That's what they were looking for. They were I, looking for me. You know, I can't agree with you anymore. I, I just, it's such, it's, it's something we've talked about on the show already about, you know, some of the problems with training and how they can really break you down. There's a lot of benefits to training. I'm not, not, not trying to... Um, play down its importance but a lot of it is like breaking you down which i think is is wrong and i think i would say even further that that individuality and really trying to brace that is what's going to get you that one percent of jobs uh -huh. no it like is. that's what's going to get you that one percent well like if you go backwards and you think now of course everyone bows to them but what would they tell a bernadette peters well don't sing like that like what do you mean well that's what she does that's what makes her brilliant you're going to tell chen with not to be chirpy you're going to go back and tell patty lapone enunciate your words it's what makes her Patty Lapone, and that's why there's only one of her. Right. You know, when you look at <clears throat> everyone we worship, they're all imitable because there's only one of them. You, you know, know was, and that's I how was, you make a star. I was listening to the 19 with Lorna. We were um, listening to like the 19. I'm so gay. I forgot that Lorna's right there, and I thought, <laughs> you know, Lorna Loft, really? <laughs> no, just just my Lorna. She's really close to Barry Manilow. <laughs> I was just um, we were listening to the like the 1980 uh, uh, recording of Company. Mm -hmm. And what struck me the most about it is how different all the voices sounded. Like, and it, and when they sang in, in chorus, it was really lovely because you could hear like the different voices coming through. And I think Broadway's lost a little bit of that. Oh yeah. I think there's like this like standard sort of like uh, timbre and tone and enunciation. And I it's I think it's yeah. Us. No, it, I think it started with like American Idol and Glee and all that, and all of a sudden we became trendy and cool, which is great for money but it is it's like it was kind of like for at least a bit i don't know what happened because i'm i was you know i wasn't around but the 90s was kind of the ghost town what they're claiming now is was actually what the 90s was it probably had a lot to do with aids you know and crime um but there were only half the theaters were full um yeah, you could get tickets for nothing. Like you, you could, could walk right. up, like you. They were the schools. I was in conservatory. At right, that time, right, right. And there wasn't a lot. Giving and, away. You know, so I don't know. You know, when I first moved here, it was just starting to come back. You know, after it was right after Rent, the Chicago revival, the cabaret revival. But it still kind of felt like we were the island of misfit toys, and it was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome to be part of this. Like we, we still had this. You know, it was we were still worshipped, but not worshipped by everybody. You yeah, were like this yeah, worship yeah. Of like, and you still had to be unique, and you still had like it was there was like a badassery of it. Like you know, I don't know if we would create an Alan Cumming today. I don't know. I don't know. You know, and even Billy Porter is from those days. Yep, that's where he. So yes, he's famous now. He's just broken through, but he was with us. That's where he got his like. He, that's where I he mean, got his leg. Grease revival is the nineties. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean. Billy Porter being a not of this earth creation of his own, well, that creation happened 30 years ago. Well, more risk comes in when you've got big corporations and they're like, it's big business because the whole country is into yeah. it now and maybe the world is into it now. There's more at risk. I don't think you'd cast a Marissa Jarrett Winokur as Tracy Turnblatt now, and that was one of the most brilliant performances I'd ever seen in my life, ever on a stage. Yeah. You know, but I don't think you she'd ever be cast now, and it would be the biggest mistake ever made. She literally took yeah. she Marissa Jarrett Winokur was so exquisite as Tracy. She had horrible vocal problems. She lost her voice from the beginning, and she actually told me this herself that losing her voice is what made her win the Tony because she had to make so many crazy choices mm -hmm. to um, to figure it out. Yeah, to. Get to uh, you know, compensate for not having a voice that their character just became this perfect 
perfect uh, creation in a John Waters musical. And she made Bernadette Peters, the great queen, Bernadette Peters, who I worship, the only Mama Rose in history to not win the Tony. No, and Bernadette was genius as Mama Rose. So, I mean, you know, I, yeah, I, I wonder. I don't. I, I think it also has to do with that weird mixing and that putting it in the nose. And call me old fashioned, but I want a chest belted D over a mixed F or a G any day. You know, I want. I, I want to fear vocal damage for you. Right, there should be some <laughs> risk, right? Like that's. Oh, like it's should, so hot. There should be some like a little bit of a tightrope walk. Oh I yeah. Mean, and that's what real vulnerability comes. And, well, that's what makes it thrilling. It's like there. figure skating. I don't want to see the four foot five Asian girl who does a triple axel easily. I want to see Nancy Kerrigan, who's just a little too tall. And there's a good chance she's going to fall. But right. if she doesn't fall, that's the best triple axel you're ever going to see in your life. But it's those. It's that millisecond where is she going to make it? She made it. You know. I don't, it's not fun if you know they're going to make it. I think it's just a matter of time before we get that. I don't know how long we can uh, sustain this idea of, of just total corporate perfection. I don't know. I mean, you know, you know, and then, I mean, but then, you know, who knows? Right. It's just, um, it also could just be that I'm old and that's the way I liked it and that's what happened. That and... just occurred to me too, that when the people, when, when, when uh, like my old bosses think, talk about the old days sure. and what it was, I'm like, oh, exactly. wow, that's just old exactly. fashioned. Exactly. You know, we're sitting there in 1999. Well, in the seventies, it was like this and oh, <laughs> sure it was. And now I'm like, well, in the nineties. So I mean, who I think, knows what it is? It's all relative. I think if we want diversity in theater, like we're like we really want, and like we're sort of pioneering before other uh, art forms, and we have, you know, before mm -hmm. there was before there was Hamilton, there was there was a uh, uh, great comet, mm -hmm. which was doing that, you know. Mm -hmm. if, if we want to get there, we also have to have diversity of like of like personality and diversity yeah, of, sure. like, of like vocal vocal style, and um, sure. every well, once in a while we get a little bit of a breakthrough when, when somebody, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean. And we, who knows what the right answer is? It's just what one person's opinion is, you know? Let me move on to the business side of things because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've worked with Tom. I, I work in, as a theater administrator of various sorts. Um, and uh, I've worked with Tom before in his shows. And um, you and Michael with your shows, you tend to do everything yourselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but this is, so this is what you talked about earlier. You learn how to sing for your, uh, sing for your supper. Sure. And if you're going to make a living in theater, you have got to learn... It, it takes time. Like you have to learn tricks mm -hmm. to like where you can save money, where you, and, and then also what other roles can you do? So yeah. do you want to talk a little bit about how you got there? Yeah. I mean, well, look, but, uh, my solo show was a big hit. We made a fortune. Um, but our first show that we strictly produced and directed, we, we lost our shirts on. We lost, I think we lost like 300 grand in two, in, in two months. Which was a lot. We were kids. We were in our mid twenties. It's we're a not, lot for anybody. Yeah. We're not trust fund kids. I moved to New York with three hundred dollars in my pocket and a dream, and thought I was rich because I had a couch to sleep on. You right. know, um, but uh, so <clears throat> you know, we learned a lot from that. And kind of, what can you do yourself? Um, and uh, one of the things that separates us from other people, and it's just how it happened to be, is Michael and I both, before we did anything else in New York, we both worked at TKTS for other shows. And we were both really good at it. Really, 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 really good at it. So um, that helps. We have, a, we have our own ticket selling company that sells our own tickets, you know? And that was a very helpful thing because we're not outsourcing that. It's our own show. Um, we know how to do it. And it's one of our very special skills. So that being said, it's not most people's, it's a very weird special skill to have. It's either you got it or you ain't. There's no teaching it. So as much as, and I, I've sat with so many people, you know, the, can I take you to coffee and pick your brain? You know, how do I do this? And it's, you just don't. It's just something we we do, you know? I, I have this problem a lot. I would, because um, people would come to me and ask for advice on how to move tickets. And it's always, it's always the same answer. And they don't want to hear the answer. The answer is if you want to sell tickets, you have to sell tickets. Yeah. You can't yeah. just, you know, yeah. This it's it's not Broadway, it's off Broadway, and you know, you in terms of advertising and marketing, the platform that you have to do that on is the same as the Broadway, and they're going to outspend you, and so you're basically just throwing yes. your money into yes. this pit. Yes. Um, Even with Star Wars, I thought Star Wars, a musical about Star Wars, would be different because it had such a built-in fan base. It really wasn't. When you pulled it all, you know, pulled it all back, 
it was still the same philosophy on how to sell it. You just had to just go out and hustle and you had to chase uh, your house every day. And it's, and it's every single day, you know, though you get that big house, you sell out. It's such a great night. You only get to enjoy it for two minutes because you wake up the next day and you have 13 tickets sold. I, and you have to do it all over again. And I think there's a misconception from off-Broadway producers and, you know, um, sort of self-creators that try this. Because I've seen, I can't tell you how many I've seen just lose everything, you know, everything they put into it. Because they didn't understand that you're, you're literally, you're, you're every day trying to make your nut. Every day. Every you're trying to cover your nut every day. And you're trying to, and you're looking towards how to cover your nut for the next day. Mm -hmm. And you play by uh, week by week. And I, I think that they underestimate how much the Broadway producers are pushing for every percentage of house like Lion King, you know, uh, and they have the resources to do it. If you don't have the resources, mm -hmm. you can't play that game. Mm -hmm. But like Lion King, if it got to 99%, they would they would go out and, and do a big marketing would. campaign to get that 1%. Of course. I and mean, why not? Because they looked at it over, because it's business. Of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you think, look at it at eight shows a week, what that 1% means one night, you know, times eight, right? Um, times 32, then times 12, you know, it really adds up. A thousand dollars becomes twelve thousand, which becomes forty thousand, which then becomes five hundred thousand. You know, and you're sitting there saying, "Oh yeah, half a million extra a year. Hmm, it is worth that push, it's, isn't it's it? It's worth pushing it, right? It, it, that buys you that buys you a month, yeah, or, or buys you or, a yacht. Yep, yeah. <laughs> whatever yeah, you look or, at it. Or, yeah, or it, takes, <laughs> it allows you to put money back to the investors, and now yeah. you can get money for your next project. It's all it's all very responsible things to do for your career as absolutely, a producer. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not. I don't want to try to to downplay the importance of marketing or advertising. No, it's really important. It's just um, the issue is, uh, and this is where they get you is, and I think maybe this is why Michael and I are so successful because we just think everything is garbage. Our, our stuff, you know. Well, we know we think everything. We, it's it's all we're all singing and dancing. It's not it's not brain surgery. Yeah. You want me to go? Wow. Tell me you removed it. A, a quarter size tumor for someone's head sewed them up and they were fine right that's impressive me telling my gals who, and guys who in non-binary pals to sing you go over there you go over there you go over there sing uh, you know be more funny sing better it's great and it's so much fun and, and it's i important. love what we do and it's good for society and but it's important but it's not the same it's not the same and you know so i can sit down and have the conversation um okay, well, no one wants your show. What do you want to do about it? And I go, instead of going, what do you mean no one wants it? It's, it's life-changing and moving and breathtaking. I can go, oh, man, well, how do we make someone want it? You know, um, as I did, we don't really take it very personally. You insult one of my actors or something, we're going to go in the back alley and have a problem. You, you, you don't mess with my kids. But, I, you know, we're not super precious about our about our work and we know... It's all so ridiculously subjective. And, you know, we've worked for so many shows. Besides our shows, I've worked for probably over 500 Broadway and off-Broadway shows. And you sit in an office and you just hear a writer, a producer, a director, a general manager just be so precious about their dumpster fire of a show. And you just think, you know, if you just had a clue, you probably would have been more successful. I'm not going to tell you what show it was, but I will tell you a story, case in point, where we were in a meeting about TKTS, and the show wasn't doing well. There was nothing we could do about it. There's nothing anyone could do about it. It was a show that was never going to do well. And, you know, we're sitting there to try to t talk about how the numbers at TKTS could improve. You know, I so, said, well, you know, if you did, maybe if we did this, did this, talking about the booth. And one of the producers, in all seriousness, took out the New York Times and opened up a giant two-page ad of Book of Mormon and went, This! This is what I want to see! And we just <laughs> looked at her and went... And Michael just went, Yeah, and if you had a show like Book of Mormon, you might be seeing it. Or if you would spend the money on a two-page ad in the New York Times. Or maybe if your advertising looked like this. We don't do your advertising. If you paid us to make your ads, yes, they would look much better. It, you know, like, but right. like, you can't blame us that Book of Mormon bought a two-page ad, and that's what it is. It's, it's just cluelessness. 
And yeah. I look at, I, I, you know, I've spent 20 years being so fiscally responsible with these shows. You know, you've watched me. You have to cut my pinky off to make me spend a quarter. Like, I won't do it. Um, and I have sat back and I've just watched these other productions open and close. And just, there's an endless checkbook. There's an endless resource of money. There's there's a someone there writing the checks. And I'm just like, over here, over here, write me a check. I will be so responsible with it. I will, you know? Yeah. But I think they like, I think, you know, it just makes them feel good. It, like, they get that, like, energy where I'm spending zillions of dollars and I don't care. And, um, you know, it, it just, it's, it's, I've watched it, we watched it for years. And, um, no, it's just a few people. I mean, this is, there is the exception, but it always will just blow my mind when somebody pisses away, you know, a $5 million budget. And I just sit there thinking what I could do with it. You know, I sort of, I got a little bit of a taste for what, how, what the difference is between somebody who's actually making their living off of producing an mm -hmm. off-Broadway show and somebody who, um, and somebody else. But the first example was a producer that I was working with who was also the director of the show and he was an actor in the show. He would literally call the phone book to sell tickets to his shows. And it was annoying for me because he would call me and I'd have to put these credit cards through it. So it was a real pain in my ass, but... That's how he kept, that's how he, he ate. That's kind of cool. <laughs> yes. I mean, he would meet people on the subway and tell them about his show and then take, get their credit card information and then sell the ticket. And we put it under their name and he would, he would tell me every location because he wanted to maximize his, wanted to maximize his sales. So he would actually, so he always had seats available that he could sell. And I thought that, and that taught me a, a, a good lesson about how you go after it. On the other side of that, I've had producer, and sometimes they're they're not really producers, they're directors or they're writers and they want to direct a show, and maybe they're a millionaire somewhere in Colorado, and they, they decide they want to do this, and you know, it's it's a little bit insulting to the people who spend their lives in this that they think that they know better how to do it, and it every time, to a man, fails miserably. I mean, may not sell any tickets, because they're they've insisted that that it's just, oh, you put it out there mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. people are gonna flood mm -hmm. to you, and that's just not the case. If you want to have a profitable show, there's a couple ways to do it. As you said, you can either have a really spectacular show. It's and, and actually, and what makes a show good is that the audience likes it and wants to see it, not that it's a beautiful piece of art. Sure. It, they have to want to see it is what makes it a good show. Sure. Or you got to go out there and high pressure, you know, sell those tickets, totally. get butts in the seats, and and then there's a, and then sometimes there's a mixture of both. You can have a decent show and know how to hustle. Right. And that's yes, exactly. And that's me. <laughs> just, yeah. No, I'm just well, I'd say I think that's right. I think that that's what you guys do. You guys put on quality entertainment for people. I think it's quality no, I'm just entertainment. Kidding. I love Star. Yeah. I think Star Wars is and, hilarious. Yeah, you're giving them a, a humorous experience. And I think the musical it. was genius. Which one? And the musical was genius. Well, it was an evolving show, which was part of its genius, yeah. right? It yeah. was it, yeah. it had to stay. Yeah. Um, I was a fan of musical before I produced it. That's right. That's I was reading that. It's it's sort of like it, it's I, similar. I, I saw it like ten times, and it just kept opening and closing, and having these horribly, horribly unsuccessful runs. And I just thought, like, oh, this this can play forever. Come on! And we were flying for Forbidden Broadway, and I'm not talking out of school. You know, they had said you you're the reason you you who you keep us open, and then they closed. They decided they were done. Ger Gerard didn't want to write it anymore. And um, so I went to John Gerard and said, are you sure you're not bringing Forbidden Broadway back? Because I'm going to bring Musical back. And once I'm doing Musical, I can't do Forbidden Broadway. And they're like, no, no, no. So. But they did. <laughs> yeah, I think Musical did too well. Um. <laughs> yeah, wasn't there a rivalry between Forbidden Broadway and Musical there yeah. for like the month or so that they brought that show? But, it's well, a great, yeah, I love those guys. Sure. They're great. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. yeah, no, it did feel like a little rivalry kind of. And I was just like, well, I mean, I asked you. Competing street teams, maybe? Did they hire a street team? Well, no, like we, one I mean, we couldn't go back, you know, and that was sad. But, um, because that just wouldn't be fair. I can't take their money because I'm gonna, we're gonna sell musical. Right, you're gonna push your show. Of that course, so it just wouldn't time, be fair, and, yeah. you know? There was, like, there was no, no fair way around it. But, um, yeah, whatever. Speaking of musical. Yes, though. it did pass it. If you're asking about the record, we did pass its record. Yeah. Oh, well, okay, yes. We, musical is the third longest running review in history now. We beat Naked Boy Singing, too. You beat Naked Boy Singing. You guys are... You're, and, and, so, I'm and, number three and four. Um, so, I wanted to ask you about that because you've done some... During the pandemic, you've done some incredible things with musical. Correct? Yeah, we did a show. We did. We brought it to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, which was crazy. So, it was just this kismet, this perfect moment where the, you know, the pandemic numbers were so low. We were doing... Going to do a national tour of it. Um, and the lead center in Lincoln, Nebraska said, 
what you know our numbers are almost nothing we're like at one percent would you do this would you keep this date here and we said oh, okay and we talked to the union and uh you know agva is great you uh musicals agva and I, it was actually very flattering where the consensus the, con the consensus around everyone was tom you're insane about safe you're like if anyone is going to keep like the cast of musical safe it's you you'll burn the building down before you'll let the cat like the right. cast be in an unsafe situation so um the lead center was incredible we came up with our with you know protocol and it was really intense to keep everyone safe uh they put in a new filtration system everything was hands-free you open the bathroom door with your foot they were, i mean and they created bubbles so it was a you know, we were only seating at 10%, but it's a giant. It's like the size of the Gershwin Theater, right? It's a big, big place, so 10%. So they um, were creating bubbles, though. So if you, you were coming from your home and you were two people, you got 20 feet, 20, foot, 20 feet of nothing around you. Or if you were a group of six, you got 20 feet around you. So um, no matter how big your group was, you got the same giant bubble of space around you for safety. And it was so incredible. Uh, it was so fun to be able to at least do, um, I mean, we we basically wrote a new election edition, edition to do two performances of it, but it was awesome, you know, so there was a Joe Biden number that played twice. Um, and we, we got to do a Tiger King number yep. where at the beginning of the pandemic, we're sitting there watching Tiger King and I'm saying, how are we not doing musical right now? How is Michael West not playing Joe uh, Exotic, you know? So we got to do it. Um, and it was, oh, it was awesome. It just went so well. It was a highlight. Of, yeah. of the last year for us. Well, that's it, it, that's amazing. I wanted to ask you. So it, when they're separated like that, um, and I, 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 of course it's it's better than nothing, right? Oh, yeah. But it, it, but the audience reaction is is got to be a little different without no, that. It Isn't was the proximity unbelievable? Okay. No, it was amazing. It was. I'd say it was our best performance, and we've done upwards of four thousand of them. I would say it was the best that ever. It, it was unbelievable. It was magic. So one of the like the box office philosophies around seating houses is. For a comedy, at sure. least. Yes. You you wanna, know. We want to. We well, want to. You know how I feel about that about dressing yeah, the house. We you are dress, very. You and, know. And dressing the house means that we're making the house look good, the audience look good for mm -hmm. for everyone, mm -hmm. not just the. And there's something about that proximity which helps people, gives people more feeling that they can. But I think in a pandemic, it's re the psychology is reversed because you're making them comfortable. That's a great point. So they're now, I think if it wasn't like that, the nervousness would kill the comedy. That's a very good point. So I think it's actually reverse. And I think by making people feel so comfortable and we had, there was mask patrol everywhere. If you took it below your nose, they would come and just say, I mean, no, you were out. Oh, they would take you out. Out. And we made the announcement, kind of like naked. I said, I want it. If we're doing this, it's going to be like naked boy singing in cameras. If I see a camera, you're out. I take the phone. I embarrass you in front of everybody. I delete the pictures, call you dirty, and throw you out of my theater for, you know, disrespecting the actors like that. I patty lapone them. Well, so I said, that's the deal. If we see anyone disrespect the mask rule, they are humiliated and thrown out because we're not coming all the way from New York, the original epicenter of this pandemic, to deal with fools. Not happening. But um, everyone These was These are the amazing. conditions of the business. The business Everyone is... was amazing. And I, that's the problem I have with people. Like, you know, if you, I don't, it doesn't matter to me if you care, if you believe in masks or not. But if a business says you, you can't follow come, the rules and discussion. Yeah, I mean, that's the, or, yeah. it's the same thing. If, mm -hmm. it, look, if you want to go shop there and they want you to wear a mask, you, that's the condition of the business. That's the condition. Yeah, you know, I did a naked show for a long time. I was very comfortable nude. Right. But I can't go to Target naked. And nope. that's not gonna make anyone sick. Well, now it probably would, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but for different reasons. But I mean, exactly. You know, um, I can't I can't just have my penis hanging out. Right. It's just that's not it. Can that's not that's it. You know, people obey no shoes, no shirt, no service. But you, it's the most ridiculous thing. And these are the most counterproductive members of society. And I never knew I could hate people like this. It's just, it's unfortunate that they, that, you know, that, uh, and oftentimes they're the same people that would say a private business can do what they want. Oh, no, th these are the wedding cake people. Yeah. Oh, they're the same. It doesn't matter. These are the, well, no, but that's me right. mentality. Well, no, that only counts if it bothers me, you know. Right. I, I just don't um, see the logical consistency there. To me, even there's if There's nothing. You know, I don't always agree with some, like, you know, being in like a big wide open space and having Well, the mask, science but... is on your side now. Yep. Yeah. The science is on your side. There's apparent, you know, there's... 
but you just but but was, like but like everything you don't know you know if you think back to the 80s there was a whole oprah winfrey where we and you have to listen and learn and and you have to wait because you just don't know so we didn't know you know in the 1980s there's aids what if we swim in a pool with someone with AIDS? Right. you don't know now your logic says well you're in a pool there's chlorine but no one knew no one knew what right. was happening you didn't have the data you didn't have the analytics um, and very similar to what was going on with COVID last year, we had a president who wanted nothing to do with it. Ronald Reagan didn't want to talk about HIV or AIDS, so there wasn't enough data. And that lasted for years, years in the United States. Years, and that's I mean, what I, happened. My understanding leadership. is really we have we have the Europeans to thank for a lot of the progress that was made with um, with developing immunotherapies, et cetera. And Bill Clinton, and when Clinton was right. in, um, it you know, um, which is you know why. That he was on the advocate in, I think, 94, they called him the first gay president because he did so, it was so rapid with the Clintons in the White House, um, the AIDS research and what, and the movement was just so rapid because once America is behind something, it happens, you know? So I think like, we didn't know about going out. So, like, the first month of the pandemic, we weren't wearing masks. We were all wearing rubber gloves thinking that rubber gloves were going to do something, but we were just spreading germs everywhere, right? We were wiping down our um, our groceries. Uh, we were told, you jump right, you take off all your clothes and you jump. Michael and I, like we were like like in the Lost, one of our favorite shows, like uh, Desmond in the Hatch, thinking outside is toxic. We would come in from um, the groceries and we'd take off all our clothes and like run in the shower. I'd wipe the dogs down with wipes. You, because you just don't know. Right. You have to have a second for the data and the analytics, and then you have to trust science, and you have to, and we also need transparent, you know, transparency. And it's going to change. And, it, and it's going and to it's change. it's always going to change. The, and that that's doesn't how it works. mean, that's how doesn't science mean works. what you hear now is wrong. It means we have more data to make an educated opinion. So, you know, the earlier suggestion is you're just erring on the side of caution, okay? So what we know, um, Probably doesn't spread outside, but keep your masks on. Right. Now, that you know, they're basing it on data. Okay, there's probably absolutely no chance you're going to spread it if you're outdoors. Right. Cool. That's awesome to know. That's not, like, that's not a... And they'll adjust their policies accordingly. Right? And that's not something to fight over. That's something to high-five each other over and go, okay, here we are. This is where we are now. That's great. Okay. My thing is, is just rules. We li Our society is based 100% on the rule of law in rules you know when they you're not the boss of me yes they are that's the whole point of a civilized society someone is the boss of us there are rules down to traffic lights i mean down to jaywalking uh picking up your dog's poop there are rules in existence so just because you don't like or a political party or whatnot that doesn't mean you don't get to go along with the rules. It just doesn't I mean, mean people it. Were it against, doesn't mean that. People were against seatbelts. You know, there's all. It, oh, of yeah, course, you know. of course, but they weren't doing what they're doing with this. You just weren't wearing your seatbelts. You know. Yeah, well, you just weren't wearing it. You weren't. You weren't. <clears> yeah. But then you're gonna die, and that's the thing. If you were not wearing a mask, is just gonna kill you. Go do it. Go, you know what? Probably better off. No offense, but like, if you're, but just go do your thing. Leave us alone. We're do. We're just doing what we're told, and that's you know. Um, there's things I think are stupid, but yeah, I, don't, I just follow the rules. I don't think, yeah, I don't like when they, when they start, when they sort of attack people for wearing a mask. I, Cause I feel like I'm consistent logically. Like I, you know, if, if you want to be out walking around in the park without a mask, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with well, that. But, and you have the science to back it up now. I, you just, you can say, you know, yeah. Discuss. You well, have let's, the science. Let's talk about acting because this could be, we could have a whole, we could oh, yeah, do a different show yeah, yeah. on this. Yeah. But you know who's brilliant with this? Morgan Fairchild. There's a there's some oh, fun yeah? trivia. She's obsessed with um, with infectious disease. She uh, testified with uh, Dr. Fauci uh, for Congress in the 80s on AIDS mm. because she's so fascinated by it. She's isn't fascinated that a, by isn't it. Isn't that a wild piece of trivia? I mean, it sounds like she has like it sounds like she has a serious hobby. Yes, you she know? is a super hobby. Like yeah. she's obsessed. She can tell you anything about emerging diseases and epidemics. And you can tell me anything about how to get tickets through the marketplace and into your pocket. I, I just think you guys are brilliant. I at can that. do that. I think you guys are great at that. And I I, I have something to add to the, that discussion because of how my uh, my view on it. I I just really respect what you guys do with that. I think it's the way. If you're small and lean. This is the way you, yeah. you know. Um, 
but you guys all, but you do all, you like, you guys do the casting and everything for your shows. And we that. do, we do. I, you know, I really like casting. So, I mean, again, it's, you know, bloom where you're planted, but, um, I'm good at casting. You know, I, that's, it's honestly, that's definitely one of my special skills. I love casting. I'm not shy at all. And that's the other thing is <clears throat> a lot of it is just being a type A personality. Um, I don't have a problem asking someone, you know, Every, like, you know, case in point, uh, Perez Hilton, you know, was the most famous person in the world with what his blog was like the biggest thing in the world. And he loved theater and he talked about Broadway so much and everyone was buzzing. I'm like, well, you know, someone's going to put him in a show because he's so famous and they, someone has to put him in a show. Yeah. Someone has to put him Ooh, in a tickets, show. Right. And I said, well, then I'm going to do it. And, you know, um, and I, uh, I called his manager and I said, I want Perez Hilton to do musical. And they said, do you have a spy? We just had a meeting in this office yesterday with him that he, the next thing he wants is to be in a musical. And I said, no, I guess I just, you know, have timing. So, um, and then we got him and it was huge and it changed, you know, the whole trajectory of musical and it was so successful and he was wonderful in it. And, um, you know, and I remember someone saying, oh my God, Perez Hilton, how did you get him? And I said, I called him on the phone. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's yeah, it's that easy. Um, and, um, you just kind of have to match, okay, who's going to be good for this and who's going to be good for the box office. If you're, if that's the route you're going, I'm really good at stunt casting. You know, that's a, a very, a yeah, very but it, good, you, but you're, it's good stunt casting. Like well, it's I've pro, seen stunt you know, casting uh, that just was way off. Well, like, like every, like everything we lean into what we do. So if we're bringing in LaToya Jackson, there's going to be a great reason for bringing in LaToya Jackson and we're going to, we're going to be in on it, you know? Yeah. So we're going to. You know, we did Latoya Jackson, and we wrote her an opening number where the, her first line was, "What do you do when your family has sold one billion albums, but you've sold two? You do off Broadway, <laughs> you know." And I mean, and you just you really lean into it. Yep. You know, leaning into it is important. I, that's that's I my entire career is and, just leaning into it. I'm and, learning that just now at this age, you know, with my therapist and things like just you know how to engage with things better. Um, so that's, uh, you know, as for actors, it's important to learn to lean into and to own things. Yeah. Uh, do you guys use a casting director or you do it? Still? Once in a blue moon, we have, um, you know, uh, when we did my series Melange and we were casting that pilot, I mean, I did a lot of legwork, but I have a, a lot of dear friends who are wonderful casting agents. Um, I think for us to use a casting agent, they have to know us so they're not insulted by how controlling we are. Right. So um, I love Cindy Rush. I think she's brilliant and so capable, but we're, we're really good friends. So when I have to, when I need help casting something, her and I can call and she can say, okay, you're going to do that thing you do where you just decide everything, right? And then, you know, I'll have an opinion and you'll either be like, I don't want that or great idea. You just kind of have to know that I'm not meaning to be insulting. I just can't help being horribly controlling when it comes to things you no. know and so like we'll make our i'll make lists you know and say okay so here's the first 40 people i want you know and and whatnot um and yeah and uh because sometimes like in a new medium like i hadn't done a lot of television um you're not going to want to hear from me that i'm casting work in fairchild you're going to want to see that there's a casting agent asking, you know, that yeah, there, it's a little, di yeah, it's because it's so process oriented. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, for some of them, you know, I still just call them. I want a Diana DeGarmo in it. Why wouldn't I just text her, you know? Um, and then when we, for some of the celebrity casting, we originally used, I, I, I paid a lot of money for, you know, an a, like a more high profile casting director to try to get them. But um, again, it just it goes back to the same rules. So by the time we cast Jack Hay, Latoya Jackson, Candy Burris, it was just us. But let's say that it's um, let's say that it's not that type of casting. Let's say you've got a show. You're not you don't have any celebrities or names associated with it. You need to find a competent cast. Mm -hmm. How would an actor get your attention? Like yeah, if they wanted to like get on your radar, what's the best? All right, I'll way? tell you a story. Uh, oh, uh, all right. So we do all of that too. Actually, um, I don't know how many lead producers in New York can do this, but it's been. 16 years or 17 years of uh, having a show on the boards, I've never not been at an audition. So every EPA, everything ever for all of my shows, I've been at the table. So if you have ever auditioned for one of my shows, I have seen you, which is not, you know, usual. That's not usual, no. Um, but I think it's important because you see people. So Amy Toporek, who was in The Marvelous Wonderettes for the last two years, 
I met her on the street. Um, we thought we found a dead body together, um, but he wasn't dead. Um, he was drunk. We called an ambulance. It was her, her mom, her dad, and um, you know, and she and she said, "What do you do?" And I said, "Oh, I have shows across the street." And she said, "Oh, you do Naked Boy singing?" And she knew my friend Ryan. Uh, she did the hairspray tour with him. And then fast forward to a couple years later, we're having EPAs for the Marvelous Wonderettes. She comes in. Oh my God, we found a dead body together. Um, I love this show. Blah blah blah. Oh, okay, fine. Didn't you know we were already cast? But the next year she comes in, right? And she's remarkably better. Like you noticeable improvement. And again, the dead body. We had a, a reason for another me to remember her. Um, and uh, and then the very next time she auditioned, she really had gotten even better and better. And um, I called her back, and she had come in um, to the theater for her callback. And she, you know, she just was really in in my head, and um, she really wanted the show. She loved the show. And um, she was, she just was so great. And she just kept getting better and better every time I saw her. That's an amazing quality. So I told Crystal, the stage manager, bring her backstage, put the understudy outfit on her. If it fits her, let's just cast her right here. Um, <laughs> so she did. <laughs> and that's what, and so we cast her on the spot. But it was the persistence and having something that makes you stick out. Um, you know, the idea where you wear the same thing every time you see someone. That's actually not a bad idea yeah. because it sticks out. You know, um, anytime you know someone they know, you say it. You say it because you you want to any way to um, start a conversation because they're just real. They're real people behind the desk. They just happen to be seeing hundreds and hundreds of people that week. And they should, you know, most of the time they're decent people. If they're not, you don't want to work for them anyway. And um, any way to just start a conversation. Um and I try to do it myself. I'll look at a resume, and if I see someone that worked with someone I knew, I'll say, oh, hey, did you do this, you do this? Because that also tells me if I want to work with them, the way someone responds to me. And if I want to, because our, you know, with our shows, I'd say 90% of the time, everyone that's been involved has become a very, very big part in our social life and personal life, too. You know, we have these huge holiday parties back in the old days, you know, that our Easter parties will have... 70, 80, 90 people at them, you know, um, so that we want people that are cool, that we want to be they around, that you want to hang out, that are nice, work with, that aren't going to get offended, that aren't going to, like, I, yeah, you know, and I want to know, and I, and I, you know, you, you, and it's true, you do talk to the monitor, and you say, let me know who's being nasty out there, I don't want, like, we don't want anything to do with that. It's, it's personal business, that's what this business is, and even though it's important to be a professional, I think that people somehow equate being a professional with being like an office drone or being super totally. clinical, and that's not it. Part of your job as a professional is to show your personality. Yeah, oh yeah, and it, it really, it stands out so, so much, and you remember them, and you know, and it's, it's such a big thing, and, and, and I always try to tell them, especially at the EPAs, it's, you know, and if I think someone's fabulous, I'll just say like, oh, I don't want you to, it's not you. Um, we're not using you for this. You're not, we're looking for something totally different, but you are so good. Don't go home and feel bad that you don't get a call from us. I would if say, If it was yeah. something else, you'd get the call, you know? And I was, one girl I remember, I was like, oh, you're so, you are so great. But like, you are absolutely, like, you're not the type we're looking for. We're casting this one thing. And she was like, oh, cool, no, cool. It's my first audition. I was just talking to my mom. I was so nervous. So thank you for being so nice. And I was like, call your mother. I want to talk to her. And I said, hi, mom. She was so good. You should be so proud of her, you know. But now I remember that girl. She'll come in for something and go, my mom says hi, you know. So I think it's this, um, yeah, it's just, it's a real I'm personal thing. I'm really happy thing. that you did that because I, one of the things I live by is that I think uh, there's not enough encouragement in the world. world is, And I think that a little bit of encouragement, encouragement really goes a long way. Of course it, it really does. does. Well, you you got to remember what it felt like to audition. And most people behind the table, um, you know, unless they're money, money people, probably did perform at one point. And it's, you know, I remember uh, when we were having the first EPAs for Wonderettes, um, it was it was already cast. It was fully cast, but we have to have the EPAs because Equity wants us to torture people. Um, and I we were having it at Theater Row and I lived next door and Michael went to get coffee and he came upstairs and went, There's a, the line is 
down the street and I just talked to a girl. They started lining up in the middle of the night and I said, oh no. So we didn't know what to do. So we went to the bakery and we bought hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cupcakes. And everyone that auditioned got a cupcake. Because we said, equity's making us have these auditions. There's no roles, but you're amazing. And you get a cupcake and we appreciate your time. And like, we don't, you know, we understand you got up. You probably got up early to like curl your hair, to warm up. You took out the good outfit from the dry cleaning plastic. And you went out of your way to come sing for us for 30 seconds. And there's nothing for you here. And that's awful. And it kills us. So we would spend time with them. So, all right, so that's, you know, we like almost make it like a little coaching or something. Yeah, just like so a mini like, workshop. Just so it's worth their time and know that they're, that we don't, that, you know, we do not take lightly that they're sharing their morning with us. And um, it was great. They had a hashtag Marvelous Cupcakes was um, trending on that. What's that audition? Audition X, yeah, uh, whatever, whatever the, whatever the, wherever the message is, board And they is. can tell you what the... Yeah, and so uh, apparently it was like the big thing of the day. It was all day long. Marvelous Cupcakes, Marvelous Cupcakes. What, what is the name of that? You know, <laughs> like what audition the... update or audition, yeah, right? audition update? And so it became like a thing. And then like next year people would bring us cupcakes and whatnot. And I'll tell you, I, you know, what makes me feel good is we get a lot of thank you cards from EPAs just from people just saying like, you know, I hate auditioning and anytime I see your name, I come because I know it's at least going to be a lot of fun and I leave feeling good. Absolutely. I have that same feeling about certain casting directors in, in, um, in my side of the business, which is film and television, uh, at least where I do acting, right? Um, and there are some offices where I'm like, oh, yes, this is going to be a great experience. There's, um, there's a, a television show in New York that has a, a particularly cold callback situation. It's a great show, and the, the casting directors are fantastic. Uh, for the callbacks, you have to go, and um, the callbacks are held in a little studio, and there's 20 producers in the show of different writers, producers, whatever, and it's mostly people who are extremely disinterested, or they're like this, and they're... Mm -hmm. and, um, so I used to look at that as like, what a, how, is, how can an actor perform in that situation? That's a really cold environment. But what I when I, when I reflected on it further, what I learned is... Now you've got permission. Like, there's nothing you're going to do that's going to wake those people mm -hmm. up. There's just not, you know. But now you have permission to just say, you know, for lack of a better term, fuck it. I'm going to do what I want to do. Sure. And that's very powerful for an actor to be able to release this need to be liked by the casting director because you're actually sort of banishing what you sue for. You're not. They, they can see through that. They can see that you're trying. They just immediately know. But I think the more you can take control of the audition in an appropriate way by just being good. Well, I don't understand people that don't give their time. You know, I'm, I, I look at auditioning as you want to find the best people. Um, and if you think of it like a plant, you need to water a plant to make it grow. You don't stomp it down. Like, I don't get it. You're, you encourage them because, especially if it's a vocal audition, the less nervous you can make them, you're going to get um, a better sense of their authentic gift. Because if you're making them nervous, their breathing's affected, their chest is closed up, they're not singing well because they're nervous and they're cutting off their breath and they're, they're overthinking it. If you make them feel comfortable, they're going to be at their best and you're going to know if that's what you need for your show. You know, there's, there's like any industry, there's people like any business, there are people in the business that really don't like it. And this is the same for casting as well. There, most casting directors are really, really warm people. They really are. They're, they yeah. like actors. That's how sure. they remember it. They like people. And But there's some that just don't want to, that really shouldn't be in the business because they don't like actors and they sure. don't like their job and they don't like reading with actors and they don't like those things. So they yeah. really shouldn't be in the business. Yeah, because yeah. someone else likes it. We're getting I, close, I love it, you know, so. We're getting close to, to running out of time. I wanted to ask you this. Um, yeah, two quick things. Mm -hmm. One, um, the lightning round is, you know, in my side of the business, we are doing self tapes exclusively now. Yeah. That's something we were working towards, yeah. but it was like 10% of the business. And now it's all of it. And I have a suspicion that when things, you know, when, when the vaccines distributed and things are, uh, safety uh, protocols are taken down, I think they're going to stay with it. I think, uh, I think you'll see self tapes. Yeah, very much. In, I think in that TV. it's, it's yeah. super convenient. They were already before pandemic. Yeah, casting yeah, directors yeah, yeah. were a little bit germaphobic in the first place. Uh, do you think that's going to be the same in theater? No. It's really hard to do, no. right? Absolutely not. Why would you want to see someone self tape for live theater? And anyone who does needs to reevaluate what they do for a living. No, I want you want to. Hear, I don't want a baby bell. I want to hear you fill a room. 
if you're singing, you know, I, I want to know if you can hit the third balcony, you know. Also, we need to know if you can get through a song. I don't want your edited song. It's also I don't want you punching it's, in. It's a different aesthetic distance. It's, it's totally different. It's so, also a vibe. Yeah. It's also a vibe. There's there's something about, you know, I hate to always bring it back to Bernadette Peters, but hello, she's the greatest. Um, <laughs> be be in Carnegie Carnegie Hall. You can feel the magic of Bernadette Peters. It's a live feeling. Uh, Liza Minnelli, you know, I've said this a lot when we were doing the Birdland fundraiser last month, but, you know, you can see Liza Minnelli with 150 people in the room at Birdland and just the great Billy Stretch at the piano, or you see her in Madison Square Garden with 16,000 people in the room and an orchestra of 20, and it's the exact same feeling. She, it's the same vibe, you know? You just feel it with live theater. They have, they just have this aura about them, and you can't, you can't find that on a tape. That's why, you know... I, all the show queens bitch about every movie musical because they're not getting that feeling. Get that. There's a something about like an, yeah. There's, there's just a, a human interaction there between being in a room with somebody. Absolutely, and that's why there's an energy you can feel off of those. And people. if you didn't, there'd be no more live theater because we have movies. Yep, we already have that. There'd yep. be no reason for any of it. Boy, I'm happy that you say that. I think that I hope that you're right about that. I think that's an important part of the. I'm not of, saying they won't try. I'm just saying they'll fail miserably. Yeah, it's just <laughs> yeah. It, it's going to be hard to get. You're right to measure. If the sure. success of their show measures is about the performance's ability to connect with an audience, because that's TV a real film, specific skill. You're trying to judge how someone's going to be on tape. You, well, yeah, make it tape. good. I mean, it it's just, just makes sense, sense right? Yeah, how sure. are they going to sound? Do they know how to work with a camera? So, or you could be me. I, I don't think we didn't we didn't read one person for my pilot. That you didn't read? You cast everybody that you actors you knew. Well, also, I also felt kind of shy. Like, well, I mean. If Morgan Fairchild reads my script and says she wants to do this, shouldn't I just bow and just keep bowing? Like, am I going to ask her to do a screen test? She's, oh, right, yeah. Uh, it's her, you know? Yeah, so it was more like a lot of them was just like, um, no, I think if they're up to doing this, I better just bow to them and say, oh, my God. Yeah, you I, know? did you have like little little small? Not really. Well, it's a did? big, you know, it's a big ensemble show. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an ensemble of 18, and it's, it's very... Oh, over layered, you know. So, everyone in it, everyone is um, like it is pretty established. From, you know, Morgan to uh, Alex Newell's in it, Diana DeGarmo, Paris Hilton's in it. Because since so it wasn't any green, it wasn't any like green um, no, unknown actors, oh, no, unknown no, no, entities. No, 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 no. Because so, that's a different story. You're gonna have to read those people. Of but course. I, I can see why you not. You no, what's the you point? I know a lot of people do. Well, it's so funny because I have you know so many friends that are so established and I just it will always make me laugh when I see what they're auditioning for and I'm like what <laughs> they know you I they mean, know you you know uh, I have a dear friend who uh was on one life to live and you know is a mega star a big soap star let like one of the top ever not Susan Lucci but a mega star and um another soap asked her to do an arc a couple of years back and they didn't want her to audition they just said you know um, you are older now. Um, we just haven't seen you in a couple of years. Can you just send a tape of anything just so we yeah. can see? And I had actually just been at her house and I had filmed her for some sitcom uh, guest spot. And she said, oh yeah, I just actually filmed something for like a, a, a sitcom. It's like a two second thing. And they're like, that's all we need. And so she just sent that. She and sent then they that. were like, well, aren't you still gorgeous and perfectly you, your cast, you know? So I think that's okay. But I will never understand... Um, you know they're a genius. Is it just for your own ego? Like, what is it? Like, in, um, for even, co like, for co-stars, guest star roles, this is starting to happen in film and television where a show that's seen you a bunch of times will just call to see if you're available for a mm -hmm. new role. And they're not Great. asking you to read for and it. And why not? And why not? Yeah. Like, why not? Yep. Like, why? You know? And that's always good when, they, when especially there are certain casting directors, and there's not many of these, and they can count them on one hand as far as I know that have a great deal of influence on who actually is going to be in that role. They have a great deal mm -hmm. of influence. Uh, they may be producers in the show, and that's certainly the yeah, case. Yeah, yeah, with me, like, if this gets picked up, I don't, I care more about uh, say over casting than I do what you pay me. Right. You know? Yep. Um, like, you know, anyone I pitch it to, I was like, yeah, sure, let's, you know, let's see what we, let's see what you want to do. Um, it, you know, Morgan is not negotiable. I wrote it for her. Right. Um, yeah. You know, and um, I have my list. I won't tell you who's on the list, but I have my list. I go if they go. 
we can talk about it. Yeah, I don't care about them. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's but that that's just so tell me about any what what kind of projects are you looking towards the future? Have you written something new? Or are you no, well no, I've been doing anything? these giant fundraisers. Um you know, we did a ten and a half hour telethon to save the West Bank Cafe in December, which um had Matthew Broderick, Nathan Lane, Deborah Messing, uh Sean Penn. I mean, it was insane. It was literally everyone. And then immediately after, we did another fundraiser for Birdland, and we did this big concert last month with President Clinton, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, Wynton Marsalis, Audrey McDonald. I mean, literally everyone again. Um, and now, so we're talking to a couple of other places. We're going to announce another one soon. That's another. It's more theater oriented and less club. But we're so um, we're doing another big show. I think in April. That'll be another star-studded thing. I'm trying to um uh continue the series i was doing i was we were working on a deal with the lgbtq channel logo and that fell through at the beginning of the pandemic because of the pandemic so um you know we do hope it lands somewhere after because logo did premiere the pilot last spring and it was really well received especially by the soap fans which is who i wrote it for so it was you know exactly who I wanted to love it, loved it. Mm -hmm. So that's my number one goal. That's what I want to do more than anything is uh, that series because I think it has a lot of potential and the people involved in it are incredible and I think the fans are there for it and they want to see it. Yeah. You know, and then um, uh, we're co-producers on the Broadway revival of Carolina Change, which is still scheduled for September, so we'll see what happens. And... I don't know. Um, I don't know where we're, you know, um, I'm sure Naked Boy singing in a musical about Star Wars will return when we're allowed to return, because why wouldn't they? And musical? I don't know about musical. We'll see. Uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff to cover. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's always a chance musical will be back. It just okay. depends on where we're all at, you know. And again, like, I won't do Melange without Morgan Fairchild. I only I won't do musical without Michael West. We're a package deal at this point. So if he's up to it, I'm always up to it. And, you know, and it depends if Rick's inspired to write, Rick Chrome, the writer. Right. Um, but I'd always do musical. It's the most fun I've ever had doing anything. And I loved it. And I would do it forever. Tom, thank you so much for thank coming you. on the show today and, like, talking with us. Uh, that's a, it's a really long uh, conversation that we've had. I'm a and, long-winded man. And we will, but we'll, we'll actually do um, uh, some clips uh, later on so that we can look yeah, at some can of the pearls of wisdom. Yeah, you can edit the F out of this. Yeah. Uh, but first, we're just going to publish the whole thing because that's, you know, Word. that's our, uh, you can always refer back to see the, the, the context. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, we're going to put some um, information on how you can follow uh, Tom on social media. Oh, yeah. And we'll put some links to, you know. I'm verified. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's you're me. verified. Yeah. So you know uh, it's not, so you know it's not a fake Tom. It's not the fake Tom. Daddy if there's Brad. not a blue check, it's my dad. True. <laughs> oh, okay. If it's not the blue check. It's my dad. Because he's a junior. Mm -hmm. I'm a junior, too. Yeah. See you next time. Uno, dos, tres.